Hello, Siddharth. Hello, Dr. Reddy. Perfect. So, I think we go live in about, okay, so we are live now. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Siddharth Bide. I work as the Science and Technology Specialist at the Good Food Institute India. And we are going to have a very interesting panel session now on the potential of algal protein in alternative meat, seafood, egg and dairy products, followed by an exciting announcement about the work that we have conducted at the Good Food Institute India on analyzing the algal value chain and putting forth a technical review paper and an opportunities dashboard for stakeholders to contribute to this sector. We have discussed throughout the conference on how rising income levels in India, coupled with a growing population, are leading to a higher consumption of animal-based products. To further continue a march towards a more sustainable food system, the first generation of shifts, led largely by plant-based foods, are now being supplemented by increased momentum from fermentation-derived ingredients and novel protein sources. In this context, algae as a source of protein and food can contribute to the growing demand and the creation of alternative meat and dairy products. Algal systems can grow both in fresh water and saline water, act as carbon dioxide sinks, be cultivated on non-arable land, and produce even higher protein by area and time than traditional crops, which are already far more efficient than animals. Algae-based food products can be nutritionally superior due to the presence of a high concentration of proteins, vitamins, minerals, and bioactive compounds. There is a lot of work going on in both academia and industry to extract algal proteins and incorporate them into alternative meat, seafood, egg, and dairy products. Today, we have with us three world-renowned experts in the field of algae to discuss their thoughts on how we can explore the oceans of opportunity and unlock the potential of algal protein. Firstly, we have Dr. Alexander Mathis. Dr. Mathis is a tenure-track professor in sustainable food processing at ETH Zurich, Switzerland, where he's focusing on more efficiency and sustainability of value chains in food and feed. His current research focuses on material and energetic utilization of plant-based size streams, microprocess engineering, and extrusion for tailored structure formation and synthesis. Innovative multi-hurdle technologies for gentle preservation of healthy and high quality food and novel protein sources from algae and insects to improve food security as well as multi-indicator sustainability assessment as basic analysis in food processing. Prior to his tenure at ETH Zurich, Dr. Mathis has worked with German Institute of Food Technologies, DIL, and the Nestle Research Center, Lausanne. Welcome, Dr. Mathis, to the panel. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Manish Shukla. Dr. Manish Shukla works with Reliance Industries Limited and is spearheading their efforts in synthetic biology-based innovation to develop and commercialize algae protein and ingredients as a sustainable alternative for business and society. Previously in the Reliance Research and Development, Dr. Shukla has established platforms to develop robust understandings on the metabolomics and proteomics of algae to optimize their productivity for commercial use. He has over 17 years of experience in leading various research and commercial areas of biotechnology, such as understanding radiation resistance with applications to extraterrestrial life, using cross-functional platforms and technologies for understanding and improving algal physiology for productivity. Welcome Dr. Shukla to the panel. Thanks Siddharth for the wonderful introduction. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we also have with us Dr. CRK Reddy. Dr. CRK Reddy is currently the CEO at the Indian Center for Climate and Societal Impact Research, Sri Vivekanand Research and Training Institute in Mandvi, Kutch, Gujarat. Before this, he held a post of DBT Energy Biosciences Chair Professor at the DBT Institute of Chemical Technology, Center for Energy Biosciences, Mumbai, and the post of Chief Scientist at CSIR, Central Salt and Marine Chemicals Research Institute, Bhavnagar, Gujarat where he spent more than two decades working exclusively on marine microalgae for their cultivation, utilization, and downstream processes, et cetera, and also outreach programs for the benefit of the society. Dr. Reddy's core expertise is in cellular biotechnology of seaweeds for genetic improvement and micropropagation of economically important seaweeds. He has further expanded his research interests encompassing the valorization of seaweed biomass for food, feed, chemicals, and fuel applications in biorefinery model. Welcome, Dr. Reddy, to the panel today. Thank you, Dr. Siddhan. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being on the panel today. So let's start off the panel session now. My first question is for you, Dr. Shukla. 
uh, that microalgae have been ex explored extensively for biofuel production and Reliance has also explored the space in the last decade. However, over the past five years, algae has been explored for high value nutraceuticals and recently as a source of proteins for use in alternative meat, egg and dairy products. Based on your experience, what is the future of microalgae for sustainable food production in India and as a protein source for alternative meat egg dairy products? And if you could also highlight a few techno-economical challenges for commercial production of microalgae for food and protein. Uh, thanks, Adarth. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank GFI for organizing this wonderful Smart Protein Summit. Uh, um, more so igniting the whole consciousness around sustainability in food and bringing the sensibility of alternate proteins. Uh, more so smart proteins to the Indian and global masses, I should say. Uh, I would like to first elaborate on Reliance's journey into algal technology. And as you rightly said, we have worked and bested over the uh, whole algal technology in the past decade. Uh, we can confidently say that we have achieved uh, the best technological uh, uh, practices in handling algae, right from um, cultivation to harvesting to making oil from it. Uh, but we should remember that algae being a crop, uh, we grow it in uh, various types of cultivation systems, uh, such as an open pond or in a PPR bag. Um, and uh, we, we grow it phototrophically and, uh, and our system is, uh, is microalgal. And um, uh, since uh, we, we grow it in, in, in a typical crop way, we have unique cultivational challenges compared to the conventional crops, uh, 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 you know, uh, seen in agriculture. Uh, we overcome them by, um, you know, uh, uh, using various engineering as well as biological interventions uh, to overcome certain biotech challenges as well as abiotic challenges that uh, the cultivation may face. We have demonstrated continuous cultivation over all seasons and and in uh, you know various kind of conditions in our um, in our site, which is in Gujarat, um, over the past four years. So so in that, with that respect, uh, uh, cultivation of algae, which is one of the first in the primary challenges at scale to address protein, is what we have a our good handle of. Uh, coming to the uh, to your question pertinent to the proteins, we started working on proteins from algae um, in the past two to three years, and uh, we have developed a robust recipe and process around it to convert biomass to to protein. And if you look at our product, uh, product uh, from algae, uh, the protein is uh, uh, um, is. Uh, essentially um, uh, having very good nutritional properties in terms of the essential amino acids, if you may ask, if you ask about digestibility, it's, it's, it's at par uh, and equivalent to, uh, better than soya, equivalent to uh, whey protein and other proteins that are available as competition. Uh, coming to uh, some other unique properties of the algae protein that, that we see now is that um, it has these small protein fractions and, um, uh, small molecule fractions in the protein, and these carry the therapeutic value. And this, I'm sure, gives the holistic value as an ingredient to the food it, it, it um, uh, you know, is incorporated in. So um, coming to the, um, you know, taking the protein further and, and, and making foods out of it, we have made various prototypes such as um, uh, the Indian snacks such as gatia, kakra, and other uh, uh, snacks such as tortilla and protein bars. We have moved ahead and also tried uh, texturized meat substitute uh, using the protein. And, um, and to outline the um, outcome in terms of organoleptic properties or, or uh, the kind of textural properties, it blended well and uh, you know it, it actually gave some earthy flavors into the preparations. Um, Coming to your very pertinent question about the Indian scenario, um, 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 uh, Indian protein, Indian um, um, India's protein needs are evolving, increasing, and um, to address it, it will come at a cost. For example, we have lost over 40% uh, of the land cover over the past century, and we are rapidly losing losing it. Um, not to mention the exceeding dependence of fresh water on a rapidly uh, depleting water table. When the Indian uh, population, which is, uh, you know, uh, protein deprived, if it looks at it, mostly it looks at the animal resource. 
And if we turn to that, as we are all aware, it will be a totally devastating event. In this scenario, algal protein, when we look at in, in a sustainable angle, uh, the land area uh, that you need is 20 to 30 times lesser, even when we compare it to conventional seed proteins. And more so, it harbors 50 to 60% uh, of the whole biomass protein. With that, at Reliance, what we do is that we cultivate it using marine water. We use the exhaust carbon dioxide. And with that, we consume two kgs of carbon dioxide for every protein that we are making. At the same time, we use arid land. So what we are doing, doing in this whole uh, effort is we are delinking environmental dependence or damage from the whole cultivation approach. So, um, so inherently, algae technology offers the most suitable uh, alternate, uh, keeping mind in the uh, Indian scenario. And um, um, as, as I told you, algae protein is ready nutritionally. We are working on functional and application fronts to make it more and more acceptable uh, for the Indian palate and, and food cuisines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manish. And this is Varun, backup moderator, Sabik Info Siddharth, who has lost power. Uh, Dr. Mathis, Alexander, firstly, thank you so much for joining us on your, on your travel in Italy. And you, everyone can see his beautiful background. Uh, uh, not a bad place to be. Your recent paper you. in, in Innovative Food Science and Emerging Technologies, and, and a lot of the research that you've done demonstrates the potential for microalgae to create extruded meat analogs using yellow heterotrophically cultivated uh, microalgae. Uh, could you please share your thoughts on how algal proteins compare to other plant-based proteins from a techno-functional perspective and how you have seen them incorporated in food products, especially plant-based meat, egg, dairy, or algae-based, I should say, meat, egg, and dairy products? Yeah, thank you so much, Varun. And yeah, thank you also very much for the invitation today. A really exciting agenda. I followed the program over the last days. Um, I'm really impressed by your program and quality also of the input. Um, coming to your question, um, I think um, we have to here distinguish microalgae is a huge uh, group. Uh, we have more than 200,000 species uh, known, most probably much more uh, available. And then we have different growth modes where we can use. Uh, Manish mentioned uh, photoautotrophic growth modes where we can use um, CO2 and um, we can uh, take it as carbon sink um, that would deliver um, in, in green biomass but we can also go for mixotrophic or heterotrophic cultivation which is a different growth mode uh, has also different production um, needs in this perspective but one huge limitation which I faced um, in the past um, during our research and development was really the color limitation almost all food ingredients are quite bright uh, so they give flexibility to the food producers to deliver a final product out of that and um, the green color can be sometimes a significant hurdle here um, to get it out is, uh, you have to use a lot of processing steps um, or you for example uh, change the growth mode and uh, we use here mixotrophic or heterotrophic cultivated uh, microalgae and uh, the heterotrophic cultivated microalgae, for example, would um, deliver um, a very yellow, bright color. And we uh, integrated them uh, during high moisture extrusion together with soy uh, into a um, formulation, which was then uh, leading to a very interesting meat substitute, not only having um, microalgae protein incorporated and I followed also the other discussions um, the significant benefit from my point of view was also the increase of the nutritional profile we can deliver very interesting micronutrients such as vitamin b uh, or e for example but also certain um, um, other micronutrients uh, to the final product and increase the nutritional profile. However, to work in the meat substitute um, business, you need to um, be able to generate um, this fiber structure, um, which is um, which can be done very easily with soy protein. Um, if you have, or if you consider um, food technology now, how also very good and feasible with pea protein, but with microalgae protein, we don't have much experience here. So you need to understand the physicoelastic properties of these protein formulation during processing and then deliver a kind of acceptable um, uh, structure uh, if you want to uh, mimic meat. My question would be again, why we mimic all the time meat? We can develop completely new products out of such very interesting raw materials as well. Maybe a mid and long term goal um, how, uh, to reduce meat consumption. I agree totally that we should um, um, go into that field, which is currently a very um, hot topic in the consumer domain. So techno functionality needs from my point of view, the color can be a significant hurdle. Our um, very bright yellow uh, algae biomass was leading to a very interesting um, chicken meat substitute, for example. Taste-wise, um, 
we have flexibility. We can use spices and other flavors, natural flavors. But we don't need to use E numbers here to deliver a very interesting product. If you understand wet extrusion, um, you can take that platform and deliver really simple ingredients, not a long ingredients list, um, to a very interesting meat substitute. But you have to understand this physical elastic properties and uh, the protein network formation during processing to really deliver a um, competitive product from my point of view. I think, I think that's all wonderfully said. Thank you, Dr. Mathis. And, and um, yeah, I mean, your, the, your point that you made right at the beginning is we're, we're scraping the surface. This is a new kingdom, right? And uh, we, Manish mentioned some really interesting work that Reliance is doing, which is essentially controlled environment agriculture. We don't have to be extractive. Uh, we're, we're still scraping the surface, still understanding all of this stuff. And the optimizations will come. The things that you said, Alexander, about needing to understand a lot of things, will come over time with, with, with these sorts of investigations. Now, just to complicate things a little bit more, I'm going to move on to seaweed with Dr. Reddy. So India has been predominantly dependent on the supply of seaweed from wild harvesting. Now, you've spent over two decades working exclusively on cultivation and genetic improvement of seaweeds rather than wild harvest. What do you think are opportunities in India for ramping up seaweed production? So similar to microalgae uh, as well, how do you think seaweed can fit in as an ingredient for this space of alternative meat, egg, and dairy products. Yeah, good evening, Vara, Varun. Thank you so much for uh, organizing a wonderful uh, summit, which has been, uh, you know, uh, I think, a well received and a lot of appreciation from many people whom I know. And uh, you are excellent. You know, your knowledge is great. I was really admired the depth of knowledge you have on protein. I think I appreciate it. Thank you so much for it. And uh, well. When you talk about the seaweed in general, in fact, I wanted to share here. In fact, a year back, I feel Alexander comes from Nestle Group, I believe, right? A year back, Indian uh, Nestle R&D head visited IS, uh, ICT Mumbai and uh, made a, I made a presentation about the possibilities of using algal proteins in their snack food industry, especially noodles is concerned, no? So she really uh, laughed at us and said, very interesting like that. But now I know whom I am mentoring in uh, one startup in Mumbai, practically is working on the possibilities of uh, using uh, proteins in the fast food industry is concerned. So when it comes to the cultivation, if you look at the seaweeds globally, they were known for the application of a food, not for any other product. So the application of food of seaweeds is going on for more than 200 or 300 years. History, it got it. So when it comes to India, because of several reasons, we are not able to use seaweeds as a food at all. So our utilization has largely been uh, you know, for the phycocolloids, which are used as a gelling, emulsifying, thickening agents and all. Okay, and since uh, we are not using it for food and the industry also is not uh, that advanced, so they were confined largely to the wild harvest. So no, no one is commercially cultivating seaweed till recently. Now only the culture of seaweeds for, uh, you know, phytocolloids also began in the country. So I consider for a country like India, I think uh, seaweed, I think I had another... Uh, uh, I know a webinar, uh, it's a virtual conference uh, from two to five o'clock, where I said the future of the future is the algae. Okay, whatever we are today using, mostly met from the algae. Not only the proteins, even the textile substances can come from algae. And even I think uh, last week, even UN General Assembly also discussed in a special session on seaweeds are concerned, sustainability. And they joined the Lloyd's Resistor Foundation, I think. They're combinedly working with UN and trying to promote seaweed all over the world. So I'm very confident the seaweeds are concerned going to play a very important role in India, blue economy. Even you also may be aware, the government of India under Atma Nirbar and also Prime Minister Machiyojana Sampada, they are trying to promote in a very big way they got a target of promoting seaweed production, reaching a target of more than 1 million tons production by 2025. Today, we are nowhere. We are not even producing 10,000 tons, but they got a very ambitious uh, uh, you know, target of increasing the production to uh, roughly you know, 1 million tons by 2025. So this is going to revolutionize the uh, rural economy. 
and I foresee that this is going to be a, one of the big uh, economic or you know, driver in India is concerned. So when we were working on um, uh, you know seaweed biofuel, so we realized cultivation of seaweeds for biofuel per se doesn't work because they already have much established market and and gain better value than converting them into fuel. So then we step into biorevenary process to recover you know, the primary constituents of the biomass like water, like lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and cellulose. And the water has been proven to be an excellent plant growth stimulant. And of course, you can do many things with that. And now proteins is something which we have already confirmed in one of our uh, uh, research work that the algal proteins, the in vitro digestibility of the seaweed proteins is more than 85%. So there is a huge possibility of growing such seaweeds as a resource for protein and all, you know. But we require to understand also there will be some kind of ingredients. Sorry, I think you went on mute, Dr. Ali. I think you're, you're back on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourself. I think I'll move on to the next question. We can come back to you. But the point you made is very interesting, which is that it's not just the protein fraction. Um, Alexander, I want to come back to you on this. So uh, I have a question about um, seafood specifically, because I think a lot of the, the, the fraction of, of the algae uh, is not just valuable because of the protein, but because of fatty acids, phospholipids, a lot of different things that are coming out of it. Um, so, you know, I think... Uh, the umami taste, the texture, all of that of seafood are things that we need to figure out. Uh, so I'm asking this question to Dr. Mathis. What are the unique advantages of using algae, including seaweed, microalgae derived materials for creating alternative seafood products specifically? Yeah, thanks very much, Varun, and uh, thanks, to, um, Dr. Reddy, also for for the explanation around seaweed. Um, I, I was working in this. Uh, currently, I'm in ETH Zurich, so I just experienced um, the, the company, but uh, I'm I'm currently not affiliated with Nestle. I'm with Academia now. Um, so. Coming to the question, Varun, um, I think there are unique opportunities and um, properties. So both uh, um, both ingredients, seafood and microalgae, come from the same source, from uh, from the ocean. I think that is um, maybe sounds a bit trivial, but um, to communicate a new product to consumers, that is very important that they understand um, where it comes from and. Um, Therefore, that makes very good sense to, to bring that really, um, uh, for example, also on the label um, uh, or to make it very visible. And another very important fact is, uh, is they're also linked. Um, you mentioned fatty acids. So polyunsaturated fatty acids um, are linked to health impacts, um, even um, accepted by the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. So that's really proven uh, health claims. Um, and um, algae are the source of PUFAR in fish, for example. So the fish uh, consume the algae and then the predators consume other fish. So it gets enriched more and more. So we can take the original source um, of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids combined with uh, um, a very interesting alternative protein in the formulation with other micronutrients and then communicate that to the consumer coming from the from the ocean, for example, or coming from the from the sea um, as, a, as an interesting, um, potentially more sustainable uh, ingredient, which can then really um, improve our food system sustainability finally from my point of view. And here really, we can uh, play that um, uh, ingredient also, um, that we can also have an interesting vegan alternative to soy. There are not so many interest, uh, you know, powerful uh, alternatives to soy. Of course, pea, but pea is limited. We can't grow so much pea. Uh, we can grow much more algae if we would use really this land um, use benefits, what um, was mentioned by Manish, um, that we can, for example, also grow microalgae on sealed surfaces in urban environments, and the majority of people are living in cities. So I see a lot of opportunities opportunities here. And I think, um, I think Manish, uh, we, we've discussed this before about how that really should be the, the benchmark to set. I think that's the sort of music to, to your ears as well. Um, my next question before I hand back to Siddharth, Siddharth who's here, uh, who's been able to figure out his power situation. Uh, from an economic feasibility standpoint now, because when we're talking about soy and that, we, we really have to think about economic feasibility. Uh, how important are other products of algae, like flavor compounds, oils, phytonutrients, these high value things that come out of it are currently used in, let's say, in nutraceuticals, et cetera. How important are they in making the algal value chain and the proteins commercially feasible? Do we need the whole thing in order to make any of it work? Yeah. So uh, before I come to, the, to your question to answer it, uh, Varun, I've, uh, I should thank you for connecting 
Alex uh, with uh, with me because uh, you told me that we'll connect some day and this is how I I never knew your plan was. Thank you, um, Varun, for that. So uh, I'll just uh, uh, connect with something what Alex said uh, in terms of the pigments and the other uh, other um, uh, you know fatty acid uh, components which bring out the distinct uh, flavors which can go in fish substitute and that has been also our experience. And coming to um, the question that you posed is about the economic feasibility. And, um, and that's where uh, you know, I would like to begin with uh, giving a, a brief view of about the composition of, of the algae biomass. <laughs> so the protein that we talk about is about uh, a larger component, like maybe 30 to 60, depends upon the, the species. We talk about the conditions under which it is harvested. And then there are the other components like the lipid, and it again varies from 50 to 15 to 20 percent. And then, uh, in some cases, it also goes to when we were when we are focused on uh, on uh, a fuel aspects or oil production. There are some algae who can be up to 80 percent as well. And then there are these components of carbohydrates and fibers, which are again uh, in the range of 10 to 15 percent, followed by um, the more. Uh, 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 a smaller but critical component in terms of pigments and other smaller molecules that are harboring, and they are in the range of 5% uh, of the whole biomass of algae. So um, coming to the economic feasibility, conventionally, if you look at all the seed protein production facilities, they adapt a biorefinery approach where they try to remove each and every uh, component in, in, um, um, in a sequential manner and try to gain uh, a maximum revenue and minimize uh, the production costs. And that is what the way to go is even in the terms of algae constituents to make it more and more econom economically feasible. From the economic feasibility point of view, um, uh, uh, as I told you, in the terms of cultivation, harvesting, our technology is, is is uh, is is most uh, most uh, stationed as far as the uh, uh, as the microalgal photosynthetic uh, cultivation is concerned. Uh, but on the other terms, in terms of the the production, the biorefinery separation parts are concerned. We we are still working on and and you know making the process better. But in terms of um, specific uh, you know phytonutrients, uh, for example, are concerned. As I told you earlier, these are the ones which have a huge value in terms of uh, the therapeutic uh, uh, constituents are concerned if they are separated nicely and, and then uh, you know, uh, produced uh, properly. At the same time, algal oils are unique and they are a healthy combination of unsaturated and saturated fatty acids, uh, especially omega-3 fatty acids as, as already mentioned uh, and discussed in the panel. Uh, similarly, we are also exploring, uh, you know, other carbohydrate constituents that can come, which can have a, a healthy fiber uh, application. And so uh, in terms of these constituents and the way we produce it, these uh, will be definitely um, uh, you know, uh, economically feasible. And holistically, if you look at protein production, it is as, as discussed uh, uh, with this panel, it is the most sustainable. If I have answered your question, Varun. Thank you, Dr. Shukla. I think that, that answers okay. the question really well. Uh, so, doc, just, just staying on the biorefinery uh, model, what you mentioned, Dr. Reddy, uh, you have worked extensively in the valorization of seaweed biomass uh, yes. for food, feed, chemicals, and fuel applications in a biorefinery mode. Uh, can you comment more on uh, the technicalities of a biorefinery process, the scale of challenges, and how they can be solved? Yeah, uh, basically, the biorefinery is not a, going to be a big challenge. The big challenge comes in the uh, raw material production. So today, this process can be optimized and standardized one go, maybe less than a year. So the processing is not a challenge at all. The processing is the raw material production. So in India, why this industry did not succeed? Because there is no production chain. And also cultivating seaweeds in the sea is a season, seasonal, right? There are monsoons. So you can't grow them in the monsoon. So when monsoon retreats, when farmer wanted to start production, then there is a seed material issues. So the biggest challenge we have today is the production. And the production is the one which is accounting for a major cost in the product uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, extraction or marketing or whatever it is. If we are able to bring down the cost of production, 
we may be win win technology is not a problem for us downstream process is not a big challenge right we have a very good engineers and we have a expertise we have a excellent uh, you know uh, fabricators with us the problem is that the algae is something very new to whole world not only to india alone right even today in the world if you look at most of the seaweed cultivation is from the sea only there are hardly any cultivation on the land but country like in india where we do not have that kind of a favorable seas we are forced to look at land as an alternative for growing the seaweeds although we have a vast sea coast more than 7500 km right so for me i believe is the the challenge lies in the production and we already have proof of concept established for almost all types of seaweeds maybe green seaweeds or red seaweeds or you know brown seaweeds are concerned so here challenge is the raw material more challenges in the raw material so the bio refinery process is basically i think i will go back to varun uh, you know uh, i think question that sustainability and cost process so basically if you look at basically i think protein uh, extraction is one aspect the other aspect is that can you do value addition to the protein like for example can you think of a, a kind of a therapeutic polypeptides can you think of a nutraceuticals so where you require to do value addition for the proteins like you can do for hydrolyzed proteins is something which i i am very fond of it right if i am able to make hydrolyzed proteins where the digestibility and bioavailability of the proteins much much more higher than the consuming the whole plant right so i am looking at the process for developing that kind of it so what we are talking to today is a is a fundamental bio refinery right so we wanted to advance from fundamental bio refinery to the value addition technologies where like for example as you know that you no know, low volumes and high value products right so so we wanted to move that direction and make it and bio refinery concern i believe i think a scaling up and i don't see as a grand challenge for me i look at uh, i think uh, raw material availability production is a challenge that is uh, holding the entire uh, you know bio refinery process today if i wanted to really understand the challenges when i do one ton processing per day then i will understand it but we do not have that kind of biomass producing plants anywhere in the country so i foresee the problem more in the production than in the you know processing i think i would like to hear to the panelist as well regarding this point that is my view i tell you know and second thing here i wanted to share one more new idea i feel is a new idea but slightly nothing to do with the algae is concerned so we are talking about animal cell culture for protein today right now nobody is talking about the plant cell culture right plant cell culture got 100 years history so one should explore the possibilities of using plant cell culture for the protein that may be much more novel and much more uh, no than in the animal cell culture is concerned i tell you know because you are growing them suspension cultures and you know what kind of a protein you want it you can optimize the conditions or if if you want to add some kind of a precursors to the media you can add and synthesize the custom based proteins or custom made uh, custom based polypeptides so i see there is a huge op- huge uh, opportunity for the people to jump in got it thank you dr reddy and these are all wonderful insights as you mentioned and we do recognize the need as as you mentioned that you know there there is just a need for creating more biomass like you know just more production of these materials and uh, i think there are a lot of stakeholders uh, you know in india and around the globe working for it and uh, we at the good food institute india to as you know you know we have been doing an exercise on understanding the key bottlenecks that exist along the value chain and how we can solve it so i'm pretty sure that we uh, you know we can all work together to actually solve this perfect. challenge perfect i welcome i'll be very happy to involve me and my institute thank you thank you dr reddy we'll definitely connect even after this uh, you yeah, know sure. to work together so uh, maybe i you know let's take one last question uh, before we move on to the presentation what we have and this is more on the demand side you know algae is not a part of indian diets and diets of lot of other countries uh, maybe extensively used in some southeast asian countries uh, so uh, and this is to all panelists if you could give your perspective uh, what are the steps to create traction in the markets for algae products and eventually algae based proteins and we could start off with uh, you dr reddy and then maybe we could go to dr shukla and then dr mathis yeah fantastic the traction is already available today the covid virus itself is a big traction for us to capture the market and today you will not believe last two months i have been contacted by many people do you have a seaweed we wanted to eat because 
the heparin has really created so much of awareness. And heparin is a seaweed-based molecule. It is a kind of a oligomer, you know, some kind of a uh, oligosaccharide from the green seaweed is concerned. Like, for example, I'll say that Patanjali was not known to us uh, five years ago. And today, Patanjali is everywhere. Even a small town, you get the Patanjali products. And the same way, I also will tell you, words were not known to me when I was in my, uh, you know, uh, doing my, you know, university education. But today, words are in the market. So the consumer awareness has already come. But the material is not available today for people to eat it. If it is available, it is available for only small society. Affordability. The affordability is a problem. Like, for example, whenever I go abroad, I get algal powder and heat. Whenever I go abroad, I get some kind of algae-based salads and all, uh, freeze-dried salads. I soak them in water and make them fresh and eat, right? It is affordability, and I'm sure today if it is made available, I think people are willing to accept. They're ready to adopt themselves to the new habits, and they're very health-oriented, and everybody wanted to have a, I think, uh, you know, uh, good health and wanted to eat uh, sensibly a good nutritionally rich food, I tell you. Today, I think uh, I consider, I can tell you, I got a full confidence. If material is made available at affordable price, there will be huge consumers in India itself. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Dr. Shukla, uh, do you want to add to that? Uh, yes, yeah, so that I would resonate what uh, Dr. Reddy has told. And coming as an industry, I feel that's the most important thing is making the biomass available. See, we have done a cultivation or a structured, uh, you know, cultivation of algae in a smaller scale. We have done it over uh, 2.5 acre scale, but that's a very, very minuscule amount. To even reach 1% of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the masses in terms of, of the protein from algae, we have to cultivate thousands of acres. So for that, we need to really scale up, scale up fast and um, have the right engineering and biological uh, you know, setup to, to push it through and the commercial setup to push it through. And I feel that uh, we at Reliance, knowing it's complete ecosystem uh, from algal technology um, you know, expertise to the retail businesses and the overall uh, commercial commitments, we are rightly placed for it. But at the same time, uh, when we keep the customer in front of us uh, and you know, we project the uh, algae protein, uh, we have to address certain challenges in terms of its uh, adaption by the customer. And what uh, Alex is already trying to do in terms of making it more and more available. At the same time, when you look at this product, uh, the algae from a photosynthetically grown system, it needs to be tweaked. It needs to be modified for the palate so that it is exceedingly available. As far as the feasibility is concerned, uh, scale will take care of it. Production technological advancements will take up care of it. So we need to write, as you brought about the challenges, we need to have the right uh, intervention of, of food technology and the maturity of the food industry to jump into algal uh, protein you know, and advancement for it to be available in terms of the functionalities of the protein for various applications in a more feasible way. So that's to summarize the, both aspects of uh, the, the, uh, the protein to you, Siddharth. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Shukla. Uh, Dr. Mathis, any quick thoughts uh, on the demand side on how we can create traction? Yeah, thanks so much. It's uh, not so easy to add here because there was already a very nice uh, conclusion made by the previous speaker. Um, I, but I would like to give some examples maybe. I absolutely agree with the previous speaker. We need to uh, improve, uh, improve availability, affordability uh, in, into the market, but we also need to offer new products, uh, exciting products which can compete on the market. Um, I mentioned consumer, um, si uh, consumer acceptance already before. So, uh, you know, when the consumer can go for a soy product, which is imported from South America, um, yeah, you know, how can we, uh, how can we attract the consumers to, to choose another one? And that is also linked to affordability, which was mentioned several times. And here we need to improve uh, energy consumption during prime production up and downstream, where we, for example, work on uh, process innovations um, based on pulse electric field processing. Nanosecond pulse electric field processing can stimulate microalgae 
uh, in different growth modes and uh, increase uh, biomass productivity up to 20%. So we currently commercialize this technology now into the market with our industry partner. I think that can really um, improve uh, um, these, uh, these energy consumption aspects and the efficiency needs. We need to improve the technology readiness level by using such new technologies. Um, just think about, we have an aqua system. So dewatering is taking a lot of energy. Why we need to dewater and uh, kill the algae? Maybe we can just milk them. We developed a microsecond pulse electricity electric field uh, processing um, uh, protein extraction um, and keep the algae alive and just extract continuously 20% um, of the water soluble protein. So maybe we can use such systems in a continuous mode to really uh, develop completely new um, production uh, systems with that very interesting source. And um, what I can always say, we need to develop new exciting products with functionalities where the consumer are ready to also maybe pay a bit higher prices with a certain functionality, for example, health uh, uh, impacts, biofunctionality, but also techno functionalities which are linked to organoleptic properties. So Overall, I think we have a unique opportunity here with a new biomass source, but let's play the strengths of this biomass source and not just copying all the time uh, existing um, aspects on the market. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So Sadat has lost power again. Um, I will just share my screen because we do have uh, a very exciting uh, final um, presentation here for this particular session. You can see this, right? Yes. So I only have a, a very brief couple of minutes. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, I, I'm announcing a, a couple of things that, we're, that we've been working on for a long time now. Our team has been working very hard on uh, a strategic analysis on the, the, the promise of algal proteins and their applications in alternative protein, was particularly focused on India. Um, so, excuse me. Uh, what we've done is we've taken both this, the seaweed and the microalgal value chain. We've analyzed it at every level. We've talked to experts like Manish, like Dr. Reddy, uh, like Dr. Mathis, and we've talked about all of the opportunities uh, to create interventions that advance work within alg algal protein across alternative protein applications. So if you look at this entire value chain, we've analyzed it from beginning to end. Uh, and what we're launching today is an opportunities dashboard over 40 opportunities across that value chain, across both categories of microalgae and seaweed, uh, where different actors across the landscape of academia, industry, and policy can come in and, and really take advantage and, uh, and look at uh, essentially building this new industry. Um, as we know, there has been a lot of uh, innovation in plant proteins that has been driving the alternative protein landscape globally. But we think that uh, looking at these new biodiverse sources are gonna be the next phase uh, of alternative proteins. We think soy and things like that have a long way to go as well in terms of their progress and, and their impact, uh, as well as things like microalgae and, uh, and seaweed. So that's why we've done this project. Uh, and as we know, uh, fungi have been doing really well recently. Uh, algae offers tremendous potential as well because it's already in the food chain, as everyone was talking about just now. It's already used in terms of binders, bulk protein sources, natural pigments, etc. So this is a very promising area. We'd love to tell you more about it. Um, we've already talked about how it's already uh, very, very important in terms of India's coastline and, and all the production of seaweed, etc. that we already have, microalgae in India. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity to grow as well. I think that that's a major challenge and an opportunity here. Um, so we're going to launch a technical review on algal proteins. Uh, and we're going to highlight all of these opportunities within it. Uh, but I just want to say that we have this incredibly exciting launch today of this opportunities dashboard. Uh, and if people want to partner with us, we'll certainly be working with Dr. Reddy, with Manish Shukla, with Dr. Mathis to create partnerships across the value chain, uh, to launch new products, to launch new ingredients, and to take to really drive this value chain forward. By the way, this is um, uh, a significant output of work by Rama Devi Tentu at GFI India and Siddharth Bide and Nicole Rock uh, and a lot of other people at GFI India. So uh, very proud to launch this particular output today. Please reach out to us if you'd like to work with us to advance this, this industry uh, of algal protein uh, and its applications within the, the smart protein uh, landscape, as well as other ingredients and applications as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and thank you, uh, Alexander. Thank you, Manish, and thank you, Dr. Reddy, for your time today. Yeah, thank you, Varun. Wonderful uh, meeting you and listening to you. All the best. Thanks, Varun. Thanks so much. Thanks, Alex. Nice to meet you. Peter.